Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to the episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Vlog, and I'm sorry I got a little bit behind on Ultimate Week. A couple other little things popped up that I wanted to share with you guys, and it kind of reset my schedule. Uh, but I am going to be off work starting on Monday. I'm going to have a two-week vacation, and I'm very excited about that. So, uh, so I will you know, get back to more videos. Uh, we're going to just stick to five a week, maybe throw in a sixth or seventh one since I'm going to be off. Uh, but I mostly am going to be spending that time writing. Uh, but I am going to try to squeeze in since I'll have some extra free time, uh, a little bit, maybe more streams. Uh, so we might stream at night after I spend like a whole day writing. Um, and we, you know, so make sure you follow me on Twitch, make sure you're you know, subscribed here. I will try to get out some videos and record some things in advance. So that way, when I get back to work in two weeks, uh, I have enough videos for you guys to, you know, stay on on schedule because I obviously fell behind this time with Ultimate Week. Uh, and speaking of Ultimate Week, we're going to dive right into this shit show. And I'm sorry to swear right off the bat, uh, but we are going to talk about War of the Symbiotes. And War of the Symbiotes is kind of a, it was a sequel, prequel slash retelling of the Ultimate Spider-Man video game. So I guess maybe Marvel or someone over at Marvel, maybe Bendis himself, maybe the editors, they thought, okay, maybe not everyone who reads this book played Ultimate Spider-Man, and maybe only gamers checked out that game, and a very few people who you know read the comics went over to check it out. So a lot of them may not know the storyline from the video game, so we'd like to, you know, continue that storyline, but also regurgitate it in a way for people who just reading the comic books who didn't win over. Whether they were a small number or a big number, it seemed like, you know, that's what they wanted to do. So this book kind of retells some of the events. It starts off actually after the uh, the events of the video game, and, uh, and then it kind of flashes back because, of course, Brian Michael Bendis loves to do that, and uh, he did that like so much in this book. It just keeps going back to events in the, the video game, and then shows like very brief, cut down, watered down versions of those events. And in doing so, makes a very chaotic, uh, and poorly crafted, and poorly paced graphic novel. Like if you're just reading the graphic novels and you're picking up all these books, because this is kind of you know what these books did. They were written in like five, six issue arcs so they could sell the graphic novels. So the point was to tell a complete story, uh, which you know obviously a lot of comic books have shifted that way from the 90s into the 2000s. And so this one was like how a lot of people kept up with Ultimate Spider-Man was through the graphic novels. And if you're reading them by graphic novel, by the time you got to this one, which I think was like volume 20 or like 21 maybe, uh, by the time you get to this, it just feels very chaotic. Like you're reading through it and you're like, wait, what's happening? Okay, Joe, it's not like it's hard to follow because it's not that well written. Like it's not like smartly written, uh, but it just jumps around so much and it has all these snippets of moments that you're like, what is going on? And if you played the video game, it makes it even harder because you're you're like, wait, but in the video game, this happened. So why isn't it planning, you know, playing out like that? In the comic so there's so much to digest here so we're going to do our best and uh, and just dive right in the best we can uh the book starts off as eddie brock he's in the uh like in the park and he's just kind of you know chilling out in the park and an old lady comes over and sits next to him and he's like hello how you doing and she's like oh hi young man and he's like oh you having a nice day she's like yeah sure and he goes well let me tell you let me tell you something and he just like opens up and he just becomes mr exposition and he starts dumping all this information on her oh well i know who spider-man is i tried to kill him you know i'm this big monster you know blah blah, blah. and so you're just hearing he's just like confessing like opening up to a random stranger and confessing all these things and he's telling the events of the video game so he like starts off by telling her about the time where he got electrocuted at the end of the first graphic novel uh so it's you know it shows him being electrocuted and then uh, you know disappearing and you know like he did at the end of the volume six i think of the ultimate spider-man run uh so which we talked about a few episodes ago and it shows that and then it cuts to like a moment from the video game where he's in the bushes and it's like a few months later and he like reaches out and grabs like a woman who's jogging by and he grabs her and pulls her in and eats her um and uh, and so then it cuts back to the park modern day and he's talking to a completely different lady the old lady's gone and it's a completely different lady there and you know they're conversing and he keeps going and telling the story of how you know he got sick and then he noticed that uh, you know spider-man was fighting this giant rhino character uh then fighting like these other villains like you know electro and stuff like that and he's like basically telling the story of that and how he noticed spider-man's head was hurting anytime he was around and then eddie of course is trying to make himself sound sympathetic he's like oh i have this thing attached to me it's hurting me i just need spider-man to help me he wouldn't help me and then like these assassins showed up silver sable and it's literally going this fast i mean it is like just pumping just dropping exposition on me like no tomorrow so like i said if you're reading the comic you're like when did all this happen like if you've never played the game you're like when did all this happen and you're like oh yeah the video game i heard about that you know but 
I, so all of this crammed into one story, like it just it feels very disjointed and just very just just overloading of information. Uh, the only good thing I think about that is that I feel like each issue, if you bought them individually, you got your money's worth. Like for two ninety nine or three ninety nine, I feel like you got your money's worth because a lot happens in each issue. Whether you like it or not, that's a different story. But at least it dumps a lot on you, and you're like, okay, well, I feel like I got a lot of action scenes and a lot of dialogue and a lot of setup. Uh, and speaking of setup, this thing in the park here, I got to give Bendis a little bit of credit. It does have a payoff at the end. Uh, this thing where he's talking to different people in the park and just telling them his story and trying to be sympathetic and trying to, you know, garner their, you know, I guess, uh, compassion or something. Uh, but he's fully opening up. And every time he tells us a flashback story, it cuts back to him, you know, talking to a completely different person. It just keeps going that way till the end of the book. And at the end of the book, you see that this guy's like, hey, wait a minute, you know, so you're the guy who fought Spider-Man in the museum. Like all this happened in the game, you know, where he fights him in the museum, Peter's head, you know, hurts. They go outside, Silver Sable tries to hunt them down, captures them and disappears with them. So he's basically telling all those events up until that point. And this person in the crowd is like, you know, on the bench is like, that was you? Like, you're that big, you know, purpley black monster thing that I saw? And he's like, uh, he just turns and looks at the guy. He's like, Sigh. and then he turns into Venom and eats that person completely. Like, full on, like, Stuart Eminem do the artwork. So Mark Bagley at this point isn't drawing the comic. Just Stuart Eminem is. And he had this, like, Venom just full on just devours this guy, eats him whole. And then sits back down. He's like, all right, where was I? And he's just waiting for the next person to show up to continue his story. So that's pretty much what happens in the first issue of this. And it's just it's just Eddie Brock sitting on a bench and talking to people, which I thought that was neat. But by cramming all this like video game stuff in and throwing it all in there and using that as the way to like fill people in who have only been reading the comics and fill them in and catch them up to date, I felt like that was just typical Bendis, how he like, you know, but it, it, this time he's doing it at the beginning of the story instead of the end of the story. So I, I, you know, I don't know. I just feel like I played the game, so I don't know how someone who didn't play the game, you know, read this and reacted. So if you were out there and you, you read this and you were just reading the comic and you didn't play the game, you didn't know the story of the game, you got to let me know how you, you thought of this in the comments down below because I feel like you would be a little lost. Granted, it does catch you up, but I, I feel like you'd be like, wait, I've read every issue of this. When did all this happen? Uh, and I think that's kind of like the, the only negative, major negative in this beginning part is that it tries to do too much and dump too much on you to catch you up. And then it couldn't even do that fully because it needed to use the second issue to you know continue to just overload you with information. So in the second issue, like it just picks up right where the last one left off and uh, not in present day though, in the past, which is, you know, it kind of disjointed again like you know normally you want to start the issue back in the present and then cut back uh, but you know again this is written more for graphic novel and less for individual comics so as a graphic novel it, it read a little bit easier but you had Eddie um, you know in the past fighting Silver Sable Spider-Man's there they show that whole battle uh, and then it cuts to Spider-Man fighting the Rhino and it's like hey even before that happened before Spider-Man so it's like it, it goes three months earlier then a week before that and then back to three months earlier you know and it's like doing all these jumps and it just again and just it's it's a lot to keep up with and i'm not saying it's a lot to keep up with that you have to be smart to keep up with it it's just just it's just disjointed just for the sake of getting a ton of exposition in there again if this was written to be like 12 issues you would have had a nice flow to this storyline. You could have spread things out, even if it was just written like 10 issues. Uh, and then you could have done like a, a big size graphic novel for this or two, like part one and part two of War of the Symbiotes because there's not really much of a war in this. Um, most of this you're seeing is stuff that happened in the past, you know, stuff that already happened in the video game. So you're not even really getting new events for the most part. And then even when they retell the video game stuff, it's not even 100% accurate. So you see like Venom or you see Spider-Man like meeting after his battle with the Rhino and fighting, uh, you know, and seeing Silver Sable and meeting her for the first time and Venom getting taken away. You see Spider-Man meeting the Beetle just like it happened in the video game. He's like swinging and the Beetle's flying by. So that was kind of neat to see those same things redrawn by Stuart Eminem. Uh, but then, you know, they start getting into it. They get into a battle and you see, uh, you know, him, you know, the Beetle going and getting his Sandman sample. Then he goes and breaks Venom out, which that did not happen in the game. In the game, uh, Trask and them, you know, set Venom loose on purpose to uh, let him battle, you know, Electro to see what his powers are and to use Electro's powers uh, of electricity to separate the suit from Eddie Brock so that it wouldn't eat Eddie Brock because obviously they were starving it. You see the whole sequence where Eddie meets Trask and he's like in the gold, you know, energy ball or whatever. And he's like, hey, you're the guy who my parents work for, my dad worked for. And, you know, you, you're you're responsible for the suit. And, and, you know, they're doing that whole dialogue. And, you know, you have Adrian Toomes there as well working with Trask. So they recreate that scene pretty well. They change some of the dialogue, though. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, uh, you know, they, they tell that scene the same way. 
and uh, and then Eddie gets broken out by the Beetle, and then Beetle goes and breaks out Norman Osborn as well, um, and then you kind of see that whole thing. So still some of the events from the game, but just altered because, like I said, Eddie wasn't broken out in the game; he escaped after they were sending him in, you know, to battle like Electro, and they wanted him to fight Electro. So. Let, you know, I guess, you know, Bendis' way of trying to streamline this, but it, again, if you've played the game, you're like, so wait, what is being retconned now? And uh, and if you are new to it, I imagine you're just like, wow, this is a lot to just get, you know? And like, again, for value sake, if you're reading an individual comic, you're probably like, wow, a lot happened in that issue. It feels a little dense, even though there's, you know, not a lot of dialogue in it, and there's not a lot of uh, uh, interesting things happening. It's just just scene after scene after scene of just a lot of exposition and uh, and action, you know, for the most part. Uh, but you do get to see Venom eat a giant horse. So when Beetle breaks him out, uh, there's like a cop riding up from Central Park on a horse and Venom turns and looks at it. And, you know, of course, Venom still has to feed at this point. And so he like, you know, opens his mouth and swallows an entire cop and horse all at once, <laughs> which is uh, pretty awesome. I got to say, like Stuart Eman drew the crap out of that. Like I, I, at first I was like, oh, that's too much. Like that's, that's, but it's so over the top and fun that it actually really works. And so I don't know if Venom or if Venom, but if Bendis wrote that or if Eminem just drew that on his own, I, I pro I'm thinking that Bendis probably wrote that, uh, but it is very funny. And like I said, if, if he wrote it, when he's on, to me, Bendis is on. Uh, but for the most part, he's not anymore, especially at this point in the comics. This is where I started to notice that he was really just phoning things in. And I think this was around the time where uh, more interns were, like, helping him finish his scripts, too. Uh, so it was like, uh, you know, I know that happens a lot. That's kind of standard in comics, so I'm not trying to throw him under the bus major for that. Uh, but at the same time, like, this was supposed to be his baby. This book was, like, what put him on the map in a lot of ways uh, outside of Daredevil and, like, you know, Jessica Jones and stuff. So it was like, oh, man, I, I, I wish there was just more attention to the details here uh but the action in it is great i think i i was upset when bigley left the book but when Stuart and imminent uh, came on i actually liked his style a lot and the third issue i think ends with spider-man uh getting rejoined with the suit so the suit after you know this is also something that didn't happen in the video game uh but they showed like a flashback scene where uh, spider-man is fighting venom and uh, and the suit gets separate. It decides to leave Eddie, uh, kind of like it does in the comic books, where it wants to rebond with Spider-Man. And that's kind of neat because I didn't know the suit, you know, had those uh, ambitions. I didn't know it had that. I knew it wanted to absorb Peter so that Eddie could have control of it, but I didn't know it had a mind of its own to want to go to Peter. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, the main reason he went to Peter is because Eddie Brock gets kind of his butt kicked uh, by Silver Sable and stuff. So it's it, I think it's going to the stronger of the two maybe, and maybe that's what it's doing, uh, sort of more of a survival thing. But it does rebond with Peter, and uh, and he temporarily for like an entire issue becomes Venom. And, uh, this, and, and again, this is not something that happened in the game. This is something that they just wrote in here to kind of change the events of the game or add something new to it uh, so that this, you know, can kind of exist on its own outside of the game. And then the Ultimates show up. And the Ultimates are like the ultimate versions of the Avengers. So Captain America, Iron Man, you know, Thor and everything, they all come down and they just start beating the crap out of Spider-Man thinking that he is Venom. And so they're like, oh, as far as we know, we just were told a, a giant black creature was in the area and it was like hurting everyone and it was trying to eat people and ate a horse. Uh, and we show up and they see one and it's actually Peter Parker. So the cool coolest thing in my mind in this sequence is when Peter is in his mind going like screaming like Cap Iron Man please it's me don't hurt me don't hurt me like Nick Fury's there he's like Nick don't hurt me you know and Nick is like just you know has his big gun out he's shooting the creature and uh, and then all of a sudden he hears uh, Eddie Brock come up and Eddie goes no Parker like you know like uh, give me the suit back give me the suit back and that's when uh, and Nick goes wait a minute he's like that thing's Peter Parker and that you were the monster so he's like all right everyone back up he's like Cap everyone fall back and he goes Thor bring down the electricity. So Thor comes down with his hammer and boom, just nails Spider-Man and it hits him with so much electricity that it separates the suit from him. And then uh, we cut to, like I guess like the next day, and we don't know what happened, we don't know the full extent of what happened, but uh, Peter Parker wakes up in his bed at home in Aunt May's house, and he's fine, like everything's fine. And uh, and he's like, whoa, what's going on? So he goes and tracks down Nick Fury, and there's Nick Fury's there, uh, Iron Man's there, you know, and everything, and, and Iron Man and Tony start talking, or Iron Man and uh, 
Spider-Man start talking and, and uh, Tony's like, wait, your dad created this suit? He's like, wow, your dad, you know, is very impressive. Like, I'm very interested in his kind of suit. Like, I have a metal suit, but he had like an organic suit and that's kind of neat. And so Tony's kind of geeking out with Peter, but Peter's like, look, man, like I, this thing is dangerous. We need to kill it. And Tony and Nick Fury are like, no, we got it. We bottled it up. Uh, Eddie's safe. He's somewhere else, you know, and, and we have the suit now. Uh, or we think Eddie's safe. He got away. Uh, but we have the suit, so he's not going to be a danger to you. Uh, but we're not going to kill it. We're going to study it. We're going to keep it. And we're going to see if we can use it to benefit America, you know, like for the ultimate program. And, you know, Peter's like, no, you can't do that. Um, and, and they're like, yeah, but, you know, you're going to have a lot of other things on your plate to deal with uh, because, you know, your dad, by creating this, may have started the next world war and there are people out there that want it. And that then a hint that, like, Beetle, who is working for Latveria, as we learned in the game, we also learned that in the comic here, that he was sent by someone in Latveria, presumably Dr. Doom, to come get samples of all these weapons, like Sandman and uh, Green Goblin's DNA, uh, maybe even Spider-Man's DNA, and to get all that to use for some nefarious purpose uh, that uh, someone in Latveria has. So even after all that, we are still not caught up to present day yet. We're still not to Eddie in the park eating people. We haven't got back to that point yet. We're still kind of set in the past, but we're building up to that moment. And uh, so in the next, like, or the final two issues of this, I guess, uh, Peter, you know, he, after finding out that his dad may have started World War III and that all these people are trying to get the suit, you know, the Beetle, Latveria, you know, even S.H.I.E.L.D. and everyone, uh, but Eddie Brock is still out there and he's without the suit, so at least he's not a danger. So Peter's like, all right, I'm going to go home. I'm just going to try to live my life. I go to school with Mary Jane everything's kind of died down most of the events of the game have ended uh you know and most of the events that have been retconned all that stuff has been ended and now peter's just trying to you know go back to normal things uh but then of course eddie brock shows up uh, at, at peter's school and threatens him and says hey look if you don't get me that suit back i'm gonna tell everyone who you are i'm gonna hurt your aunt may i'm gonna come after everyone so now he's like full-on going super villain in a way and kind of going the way the uh, main universe venom went for a while where he was threatening peter parker's personal life uh, and saying like look i don't want to hurt these people but i will and i'll expose you and i'll do everything if you don't get me that suit back so then you know peter's like uh you're gonna come up and threaten me like are you kidding me I sh like and for me i'm like why didn't peter just knock him out and bring him to nick fury like that's what i would have done I, I wouldn't have handled that i wouldn't have taken that threat like that i would have been like no dude you threaten my family i'm gonna punch you in the face knock you out and bring you to shield uh and they're gonna send you like somewhere else like in the world away from the suit and you're never gonna get again you're never gonna get to see the light of day again um but uh but yeah yeah, that didn't happen obviously because Peter's like a 15 year old kid and didn't think about that probably uh he was more concerned about the safety of his family so um but he you know he goes home that night and he finds surprise and so earlier in the issue uh they show shield and the Triskelion and you have uh shield agents uh and doctors interviewing Gwen Stacy they're talking to Gwen Stacy and almost interrogating her and they're like you know what happened to you and we're like wait a minute you know as, as people who've been reading the comics you're like wait Gwen's dead because in the video game Peter became Carnage because Gwen died so they, they decided to make Peter Carnage temporarily in the video game as one of the boss fights which I thought was a cool idea uh, especially considering the Carnage comic was you know the, the suit was trying to replicate Peter and it was kind of a clone of him in a way uh, but now we see Gwen Stacy's back and they're asking her about the suit you know how did you turn back into this form and she's like I don't know and they're like yeah but when we brought you here you were a Carnage suit we, we confiscated you from one of Dr. Connors' labs or whatever and you were like a big red monster suit and now you look like a 16 year old girl um that you killed so what's going on here and they start realizing that the the suit the last person it fed on was gwen before peter took it down and so it uh, has spent time with her dna and started to replicate her dna and is now essentially a perfect clone of gwen uh, even though it still has the carnage side and some of peter's memories it's mostly now a perfect copy of gwen for all intents and purposes so i think this was just you know bendis's way of retconning what a lot of fans like gave him crap for they were like dude you killed gwen for no reason it was just random and it, you know and of course that's how death happens sometimes so on some level it did work but on a lot of levels it just pissed off a lot of fans because we were hoping that maybe we would get one universe where a Gwen Stacy stayed alive and uh, and so he got a lot of hate for that like I said if you read the letters columns and a lot of those issues after Gwen died a lot of people were writing in uh, and Marvel was publishing them too to show that fans were not happy so I think this was his way of retconning that so uh, so she's you know talking to shield people and then there's a big you know beetle comes in to bust out uh, the Green Goblin and that's kind of an event that happened in the game although in the game it wasn't at the Triskelion it was on a ship out in the sea but again this, there's more retconning here going on I think and the beetle shows up to bust out Green Goblin and as Green Goblin's leaving and this did happen in one of the earlier Ultimate Comics you saw Green Goblin leaving and he looks down a hallway and sees someone well now in the book in this book you're seeing that when he looked down the hall he saw 
saw Gwen Stacy uh, because all the you know criminals and everyone at the Triskelion all escaped during you know during this big attack or whatever, and so he saw Gwen walking away. So this picks up right after that moment where Gwen washes to shore. She jumps out of the you know the Triskelion building, swims up to shore uh, nearby, and then she you know she's still having attributes of the carnage suit but she only knows one place she only knows one home and that's the you know the peter parker uh aunt may's house you know in queens so she ends up going there and when peter comes home after a long day of you know everything and being threatened by eddie brock he comes home and finds gwen stacy sitting on his carpet uh basically just wearing a t-shirt and her face is looks like carnage but the rest of her looks like gwen and, and she's having trouble you know controlling the suit and uh, and now with peter around it's agitating the dna in her and like the, the clony carnage type dna in her uh but you know you know so peter's like freaked out he's like gwen is that really you so then her face changes back because she gains she starts to gain control and they hug and you know she's like it, it, i think it's me i don't know what's going on what's happening so uh so peter's like you know trying to comfort her and, and be there for her and then uh you know and, and so they, they're like talking like in his basement or in his you know in his room or something like that and then aunt may comes down to answer a knock at the door and when she opens the door it's it's Eddie Brock and Eddie Brock's like hey where's Peter and she's like Eddie you know he told me about you he said you're a bad guy and Eddie's like what I'm not a bad guy like I'm just here to talk to my friend so Aunt May actually pulls a gun on him because at a lot at this point you know Norman Osborn has showed up to try to threaten her villain Dr. Octopus like she's been in jeopardy numerous times so now Aunt May is not messing around and S.H.I.E.L.D. gave her a gun I think uh, because they talked you know they have a moment with her early on in the story where you know they, they come to make sure she's okay because they think she has a heart attack from like a, a fight that uh, Spider-Man gets into and she starts to realize you know Spider-Man is Peter Parker and so so she She's like, yeah, I, I, I'm, this is too much for me to handle. So I think she's ready now. She doesn't want her nephew hurt. She's trying to be protective. So she draws a gun on Eddie. She's like, you're at my home. You're, you, you know, you're not going to hurt my nephew. So Eddie takes the gun from her and he's, and he actually turns it on her. He's like, you tell your nephew to come out right now, or I'm going to shoot you. So you, clearly, you know, Eddie is not a nice guy anymore. Like he has gone way off the, the deep end in my eyes. And uh, but Peter hears all this, comes out, grabs Eddie beats the crap out of him, takes him a few blocks away, knocks the gun out of his hand, you know, and everything. And he's like, you know, what are you doing? Why'd you come to my house? You aimed a gun at my Aunt May. Like, he's, you know, furious. And then, uh, you know, Gwen actually followed him there. So Gwen comes up on the roof, and this is pretty much where the war of the symbiotes, like, happens, is it all happens in this one issue in these, like, few pages, because Gwen, when she walks up, she finds, like, Eddie says, they took the suit away from me. They, As far as I know, they destroyed it. It's gone completely. Uh, and I just want, I want, so, I want the suit back. I need something. So you've got to have S.H.I.E.L.D. make me another suit or else I'm going to tell everyone about you. And, and Peter's like, no, we're done here. You know, I'm going to arrest you. Like, you're, you're basically what I said for him to do at the beginning of the story, he's finally doing now after his Aunt May was in jeopardy. And so Eddie's like, no, you you got to give me the suit. Well, it turns out he actually still has cells in his body like Peter did when he got separated from the suit. He still has cells in his body of the the symbiote uh, or the the ooze or the suit or whatever it is, and uh, and Carnage or Gwen Stacy, she her uh, DNA acknowledges that. So she turns into Carnage and then she goes and attacks Eddie. But as she's like stabbing into Eddie and scratching Eddie, he's absorbing her, uh, kind of like he did in the video game when he absorbed Peter Parker and ate the you know the symbiote off of him. So Eddie eats the suit off of Gwen and leaves behind a, a fully, you know, a perfectly cloned version of Gwen Stacy, and then now he has eaten the carnage suit and brought it into him, and has become like twice his original size. He's Venom now, he's in control, uh, because he has Peter's DNA and like this Gwen Stacy clone thing DNA, he has it all absorbed into him now. So now he's just one big monster ready to attack Peter Parker. So Peter, you know, he fights for his life, he puts up a good fight, uh, but then S.H.I.E.L.D. and Iron Man and uh, everyone descends down and they you know shoot at venom he gets away he slinks away he does something that i didn't even know he could do because i thought always eddie brock is inside the suit right i didn't know the suit became eddie brock but i guess that may have changed now that he's in complete control because he uh, the suit just kind of liquefies down into a sewer lid and to me i'm like well that wouldn't really work because eventually eddie would have to like squeeze through the bars which would be impossible for him to do uh, but the suit ends up doing that and that's how he gets away so i'm assuming maybe that that's just something they decided to do was make him fully liquid he can like eddie brock can fully turn his body into liquid i guess i have no idea uh, i think it was just maybe an oversight or something uh but or they just wanted to get him out of there quickly and that's what they decided to do and they thought it was visually cool over you know practicality or making any kind of sense uh but eddie brock gets away and gwen is left and she's intact and so they you know uh, shield brings peter in and gwen for a debriefing uh peter and and aunt may is there and they find out that gwen is fine that she's a perfect clone she has all of her memories and she's for all intents and purposes 
100% back to real life and as close as, you know, like basically it's a huge retcon. It was retcon the comic is what this was called. Uh, and so Gwen is back and so now she could go back to school with Peter and be part of Peter's life again and be his friend again. Uh, and then like the weight of her death and everything, like, you know, it doesn't, it won't weigh on Aunt May and they won't feel so responsible. So I guess it was a way to like kind of undo some of that and undo some of the darkness that the book had taken on. Uh, but, uh, but to me it was just like really rushed and really thrown in there. And this war of the symbiotes, this battle between Carnage and Venom lasted like three or four pages before Venom absorbs the Carnage suit and then becomes like Super Venom and escapes. Uh, so yeah, it didn't really, didn't really, you know, it's, it's, oh man, this book is, this book is not good in my opinion. I mean, is it worth reading? Sure. If you want to read it, the art, Stuart Eminem, he's a great artist. Uh, so there's interesting little things like that in here, but man, out of all the ultimate Venom Marvel stuff, uh, this and Carnage are like the bottom, like the bottom of the barrel, just half told story, half assedly done, uh, just not very well structured uh, from a writing standpoint at all. Uh, but I will say that there is the payoff. So Ed, like I said, this was this probably ended the best out of all of them because there's an actual payoff to the setup from the first issue. So in the beginning when we're back, you know, we we're in present day and Eddie was eating people in the park, which I thought that was kind of a cool premise and idea. Um, and so now we're back to that and he's in the park. A guy sits down next to him and the guy's like, hey, nice day, hon. And he's like, yeah, though well, that's normally his line because that's how he introduced himself to everyone is, hey, nice day. So this guy was saying it to him now. So Eddie's like a little cautious of the guy and he's like, yeah, nice day. Uh, and so they're talking and then Eddie uh, realizes that the guy knows more than he's letting on. So Eddie turns into Venom because now he's in complete control, but apparently he still needs to eat and feed off people. Uh, so control doesn't mean that, you know, the appetite is quenched. And so he turns the guy, turns into Venom, goes to eat him. But then the guy opens up his, like lifts up his shirt, pulls the sleeve back and you see the Beatles armor. So this guy was actually the Beatle in disguise as like a civilian and opens up a container on his arm and sucks all of Eddie Brock into his arm. So again, I'm thinking that Eddie Brock himself has is able to become liquid form now after this, you know, after he merged with Carnage. It kind of because Gwen could kind of do that since she was like a genetic clone. She can kind of turn into liquid and move around with the suit. So there was no human body to like, you know, get stuck if she was trying to pass through bars or anything. So I'm guessing that's what happened to Eddie. That's told visually. It's not told through the story or through the writing. So uh, so I'm thinking that's just like a Stuart Eminem visual thing that they put in there. Uh, but it's kind of neat. So he gets sucked into the the, uh, the gauntlet and Beetle, you know, Tur you know, turns into the beetle, the armor wraps around him, kind of like Iron Man style, and he flies off into the sky, and he says, you know, uh, inform, like someone on the intercom is like, did you get it? And he's like, yes, I got the Sandman thing, the, the Green Goblin DNA, the other DNA that I was supposed to get, and now I have the Venom suit, and I'm coming back to Latveria to deliver it to my lord and master, Dr. Doom. So you're like, okay, so uh, clearly Dr. Doom is, has some kind of investment in all these genetic creatures that have been made, but none of this, if you're wondering, well, where does the story go? What happens next? See, like, is the Spider-Man go to Latveria and fight Dr. Doom? No. That would be an awesome story, but no, he doesn't. Dr. Doom does get involved with the story coming up, and there's a big ultimate crossover and everything, but we're not going to talk about it because it sucks, and it doesn't really matter about anything, and it doesn't have, like, all the ramifications, although I think it changed the Ultimate Universe in a good way, and it made things interesting after this, because then Reed Richards became, like, a villain called The Maker, which I thought that was cool as a Fantastic Four fan. I thought that was kind of a neat thing, and it kind of changed, killed, like, half the X-Men, and it changed a lot of the landscape of the universe. It still was a pretty poorly uh, constructed event and story, and then because of that, they decided to go in a new di direction with Spider-Man and create Miles Morales, so a lot of these threads, as far as I know, never got wrapped up. So if you're out there and you if you know information that I don't have about maybe where this story goes, where if, if they ever did pick up the symbiote again, uh, let me know because we are going to talk about other symbiotes in the Ultimate Universe. In Ultimates 3, a clone symbiote shows up and we'll talk about that in the next episode. And then there's also the, um, the, the new Venom that went after Miles Morales uh, like a couple years later. So we'll talk about that one too. But in between this and that, I don't know if there's any story told there. I don't think there was. I, uh, I'm pretty sure there wasn't. But if there was, you know, feel free to let me know in the comments, and I'll look up those issues, and I'll read them and, uh, and cover them for you guys. But to my knowledge, there's nothing after this. So this story ends with a good payoff to the setup. You know, Eddie Brock in the park. Now he gets caught. So I'm like, hey, perfect setup, payoff. The bad guy gets caught. It's I thought that worked out pretty well. So congratulations, Bendis. But everything in the middle was just a hodgepodge and it was just a mess and it wasn't well constructed, wasn't well paced and just, just dumping, you know, like a, a four, like a, you know, like a 20 hour video game or a 10 hour video game, just dumping all that on you in like four issues. It's just too much. Like this, 
this guy needs to learn how to pace himself. And the weird thing is he did in some of the other books he wrote, like Daredevil and like, you know, Jessica Jones and Powers and things like that. Like he found a way to pace himself. So it was really weird to me that he couldn't do it with Ultimate Spider-Man here uh, because most of my gripes with his runs on these is that they don't allow themselves to breathe, especially the symbiote ones. It's clear that he doesn't like these characters and he's just trying to get through the story. And so to me, I'm like, well, why did you write them at all? I know fans wanted them, but if you didn't want to write them, why did you write them at all? It makes no sense. Let some other writer take, you know, a stab at making, you know, an ultimate Spider-Man story. Uh, but again, like it always comes down to with Bendis, I feel, is ego. Uh, whether he's a nice guy or not doesn't matter because what I review is the stories and this one is dog shit on a lot of levels, in my opinion. And you know you know me, guys. I'm, I'm very lenient on a lot of things. I try not to just crap all over stuff. Uh, but for me, this one was just a major miss. Interesting things, as always, but nothing pays off. Nothing feels organic and nothing evolves in a nice way. Minus just the cool setup at the beginning with Eddie in the park and the end where he gets captured. But that's it. That's the end of War the Symbiotes, a battle that lasted four pages, uh, you know, so <laughs> let me know what you guys think in the comments. What do you think of War of the Symbiotes? I know at least a few of you are going to rant about how much you hated this storyline, uh, but let me know if you liked it, if you didn't like it, whatever it is, let me know down below as always. And thank you so much for watching my show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll come back as soon as I can with the final episode where we talk about Miles Morales versus Venom and the Ultimates versus Venom and like the clone Venom that they fight in Ultimates 3. So we'll get on that as soon as possible. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good one. Peace.